Welcome to the Futurati Podcast. Any member of the Futurati is somebody who believes in the power of the future. We know there's a better world ahead, and we indeed have the power to make it so. In our podcast, we talk to the best minds in the world about the most urgent problems facing mankind today, and we hope you learn as much from them as we do. I'm Thomas Fry, a professional futurist and keynote speaker. And I'm Trent Fowler, a machine learning engineer and author. Thank you for joining us. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for listening to the Futurati Podcast. Today, we're joined by artificial general intelligence researcher Kristen Thorson. Dr. Thorson, thank you so much for being here with us. My pleasure. So I wanted to start by giving you the opportunity to talk a little bit about your past, your interests, and what it is that brought you to working on the problems that you're working on today. Yeah. Um, if, if I wind back to uh, when I was 12 years old, um, if I allow myself to go that far uh, back in time, to uh, the last century. Um, there was the summer uh, when I, uh, in the year when I turned 12, that I, I realized that the future would, uh, in the, the future would bear uh, some very important technological advances. And I had this very um, strong feeling that computers and robots might be very important. And um, I, and that was really a defining uh, moment uh, in my life because uh, after that, uh, a lot of my decisions were either uh, uh, obviously or not so obviously uh, influenced by, by this, including um, my decision to, to study psychology and, um, and then to uh, join the media lab where I got to actually sit in uh, uh, the course with Marvin Minsky, um, <clears throat> which was which felt very surreal because uh, only a few years before um, I and and I still remember a, a time when I thought, okay, by the time I will be educated enough to work on these very very interesting problems, they'll all be solved because obviously they are so important that everyone will will work on them and therefore you know we'll have. AGI, we didn't, of course, use that term, but um, we'll have, you know, intelligent robots before I ever get to work on it. Uh, little did I know it would be this far behind the predictions. <laughs> yeah, Eliezer Yudkovsky has got some some uh, panel discussions that he, he's done and that you can find on YouTube where he says that it, he continues to be amazed that there's so little attention on most of these problems, AGI and, and, and various other related things. And he's got this phrase that uh, it's something someone has to do something and it's completely ridiculous that it has to be us. But, you know, work <laughs> needs to be done on the area. And I'm glad to see that we've got minds like yours on it. I, I am sort of interested in how you ended up at the media lab and, and what took you from psychology to AGI. Like, like, why was that the route that you felt would be the most direct into the field? Well, it, it turned out that uh, that was a very fortunate uh, turn of events and uh, not so much because I had a grand vision and, and realized that all things considered, that would be the, the one and, and, uh, and true path, but, um, but rather a, a more a mixture of opportunism and uh, just circumstantial uh, uh, opportunities and, and uh, decisions and interests. And the... Whenever I talk to to friends who were studying computer science, I I, I never felt that they used word pro words properly. They they talked to, they talked about you know some colleague of theirs was quote unquote teaching computers to speak, and um, and I, I you know that's that's just never felt right to me that somehow it felt like they were fooling themselves into by using improper te terminology. They, they felt like they were solving big problems and they weren't. Now, um, and for, but, but for the longest time, I really thought, uh, you know, there must be something wrong with me because the way these people talk, you know, it looks like all of the solutions are around the corner. And, you know, they know the solution. If you only give them six, uh, six months to six years, they'll, they'll have them figured out. And, um, and so I thought, you know, what's wrong with me? There's, I'm not getting something. There's something I'm not getting. 
And so I kept just studying and studying and, uh, and eventually got enough self, uh, 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 well, uh, belief in myself that, that I realized, you know, they were wrong and I was right. <laughs> <laughs> of course, uh, it, it all seems so obvious now, but for about 20 years, it really wasn't. When you have a whole field where the majority of the field is betting on the premise that if you have a machine that can play chess and win the world champion in chess, it must have general intelligence, then you just keep, and these are the prominent minds in the field, you just keep reading and reading and like, what am I missing here? Why, why am I not getting it? You know. Um, what, what do you think it is that drives that lack of clarity on intelligence? Because I know what you're talking about. And way back in 1953 at the Dartmouth conference where they coined the term artificial intelligence, it was estimated that a dozen scientists working six months could build a fully general system. And, and you're right. There's this tendency throughout the history of artificial intelligence to assume that if X problem was solved, that would be equivalent to general intelligence. Why do you think it is that we're so bad at understanding the mechanisms of general intelligence? Yeah, I've thought a lot about that. Um, I think it's, a, you know, at the bottom of it, I think it's a complex um, issue about how the human mind works, really, and how, but it's especially uh, uh, how societies work. Not to delve too deeply into that, but I think I can uh, chop that into and shorten that into uh, a couple of sort of thought nuggets for you. One is that um, it's a complete misunderstanding that, that advances on deep questions are solved by industry. So essentially, uh, it's, it, you, you have only academia working on the hard problems, and only a fraction of academia are working on the hard problems with re respect to, to uh, general intelligence. Or AI, you know, or real AI, as, as I, I like this term a lot. Because, you know, you say real AI and everyone knows what you mean, you know, because because the artificial intelligence we have is artificial, artificial, artificial intelligence. We, it's not real artificial intelligence. Um, and <laughs> and uh, now you have a mechanism in academia that uh, rewards the number of papers published. And uh, I know people like to downplay this mechanism. It is a very strong mechanism. And over time, when you have it, you know, it, it may not be so bad if you look at a period of, say, five or 10 years. But when you have a, a hundred years of that, you realize that this is, a, this is a molding apparatus that every generation essentially uh, has a narrower view on what it means to be an academic and what, how you pose your academic questions and how you put them together into publications. So when you have when you reward publications that only publish the smallest possible delta, then you never have uh, well. Then you have a a, a system that discourages uh, taking long periods working on the really hard questions. That's just a natural tendency. So that is, I think, a really very strong. Uh, uh, mechanism and I don't think and it's not just you know you, you when you hear that argument you, you tend to think uh, about your peers and your own career and you know maybe it spans 10 years maybe it spans 20 years um, maybe as in my case you know it's already 30 years but or even more but but if you but it doesn't really do it justice you have to think about this as a long-term grinding machine so this is a really strong mechanism, I think, that, that uh, has that effect. The other is the complete lack of interest in academic research uh, in systems. And I know I'm rounding that down because of course there is some interest in that. Um, if you look at, for instance, uh, engineering and biology, there's, there's not a chance in hell that they can actually do their work without thinking about systems, complex, networks of interacting factors. Um, so of course I'm rounding down, I'm simplifying, I'm, I'm drawing a cartoon, 
But the kind of system systems thinking that I'm talking about is a fundamental um, way of life kind of thinking about systems. There is no system science really, and the the little we have in uh, computer science, which is the the field that probably studies systems the most, um, and especially in in you know trying to abstract them and and playing around with them. Um, there is a, a little bit of you know um, network theory, uh, graph theory. There, there's, it's very sparse, and the math we have is very much devoid of time. And you can't talk about systems without time. Yeah, I wanted to ask you the question about: uh, Are you familiar with this concept of the the Polanyi paradox? Um, it's Karl Polanyi is an Austro-Hungarian economist, and he uh, he came to the conclusion that we we know more than we can tell, and in a human-based world, there's lots of things that we do that uh, we can't really explain how we're doing it. Um, yeah. If we're teaching somebody how to dance, uh, as an example, that's really difficult to explain all of the things that are going into that. Uh, that motion. And so when you talk about uh, a systems approach to things, it, it seems like um, a lot of our systems are, are, are based on the notion that uh, humans will figure out the, the gaps that are in, in the systems that we have. Um, do we run into that type of problem with the AI that you're working on here? Yeah, I think... Um there's a there's a methodological issue underneath all of this, um, which is that which you could think of as a as a third uh, reason for for some of the the for for this situation we're in with respect to solving AI if you could call it that, um, and that has to do with um, the assumptions that the scientist uh, brings to any problem. The assumptions uh, essentially paint the scope or, or delineate the scope of what is what is possible for or, or what the scientists could possibly hope to address in their research. Um, and if the scope is too narrow um, for a complex nonlinear system, then it can never address uh, more than a part of the system. And if you have a, a, a system, um, it's sort of, let me just paint a picture. If you had aliens come to Earth and they, they've never seen an internal combustion engine, and um, they uh, bring their assumption that it's got everything to do with electricity. And they may figure out the spark plugs and they may figure out some parts of it. And they try to put the, this, uh, you know, an engine together from scratch, you know, using that. But their assumptions um, basically limit them to only explaining part of the system itself. So they can't put it together completely. And they try to wave their arms around and say, you know, well, the rest is kind of, you know, yeah, we already published 20 papers on this, you know, so we must be right. But you can't really <laughs> build the machine because their assumptions are wrong. And, and then... Well, and then people go, well, you know, uh, people from other fields will, will think about the other, you know, some other group of scientists will come along or alien scientists and say, okay, well, it's all about the gasoline, right? And so they will look at that part, but their assumptions, now, if it's a layered system where you have to have mechanics and like in an internal combustion and you have to mechanics and you have to have uh, um, friction and, and you have to have chemistry, all of these in a, you know, only partial you know, parts, you know, in each, but these are layered. And if you, if you get some of these wrong, you, the, the, the engine doesn't run. Right. And you can't point at this engine that they, the aliens created from scratch and say, okay, look, it does exactly the same as this, this internal combustion engine that the Earthlings built, and it works so beautifully. No, they'll keep scratching their head. And because the assumptions about the other group are incompatible with uh, those in the first group. So even if they have beautiful theories on each side, you know, here's here are all the electricity theories and here's all the, you know, 
gasoline theories and and you know now we should just you know all it is is just putting things together no it's not like that because <laughs> the the paths that they ended up in the theories are incompatible in some fundamental way so you almost always end up in this situation by throw you have to throw everything away it's almost as hard sometimes even harder because you've already painted yourself into a two separate corners so so uh, something that was never mentioned in my whole um, career uh, a, a, or education in, in AI was methodology. No one ever talked about that. I am curious as to what you think the solution to that problem is. Um, you mentioned earlier that there's this paucity of research on complex systems and complex dynamics. Do you think it will be a matter of inventing entirely new kinds of math to capture this? Because with current techniques, we almost always have to make simplifying assumptions in order to get any of it to work at all. And I just, I personally don't know enough about it to be confident, but it seems like that's fairly insuperable, that you're always going to kind of have to do that. And so I don't, I don't know that you'll ever be able to, to satisfactorily characterize the behavior of these systems with feedback loops and emergent dynamics and all of these other fancy things that are responsible for human intelligence and swarm intelligence and the other things that we might be interested in? Um, well, I have a, a personal view on that. Um, but I, I have to warn you, I'm a bit anti-math. Um, <laughs> An AI researcher that's anti-math. <laughs> there is a re there's a good, I have a very good reason for it. In fact, if you look at history, the math never came first. That, that, this is a misconception. The math always comes after. The, the math requires really crisp and clear and pretty much spot on definitions of everything. Now, by definition, if you are studying a phenomenon that's complex and not well understood, how are you going to come by those definitions? And if you force yourself to, to come up with them, to make those definitions up, um, are they likely to be spot on the first try? No, Probably I would say not. no. It, it, it's possible. Don't get me wrong. I, I don't dislike math. Uh, but in the sense of saying, let's do the math first, and then we'll figure out how, out how it works, I think that's completely the, the wrong way around. And history already pr has plenty of evidence for that. So I would say tread very lightly in that direction. I'm not ruling anything out. I mean, anything that works, anything that can get us to understand this complex phenomenon, I'm all, all for it. So, so I, I, you know, I, I just, I'm trying to be a bit provocative here, but um, I feel very strongly about this. If, if you, I, I could put it this way. If the Wright brothers had sat down and said, you know, I have this really strong feeling that we can make a heavier than air flying machine. And and uh, and and they they looked at each other and said, yeah, let's let's uh, let's figure out the math for that. You know, do you think we'd have it flying airplanes by now? I doubt it, honestly, because the, all of the aerodynamics, everything else, that was that happened 40, 50 years after. Okay, so this is an excellent segue into discussing the actual architecture you're working on. Before we get there. I wanted to at least address a question that comes up in discussions of this kind. You've said that the way that computer science professionals talk about the concepts in their field can be a little misleading. Like when they say they're teaching a computer to talk, not really, right? So how do you define intelligence and general intelligence? And how will we know when an AGI is a plausible source of competition or cooperation? I do think there are some features of intelligence that um, most people will agree on. Uh, it's very hard not to call real quote unquote intelligence when they see it. And so I, I, do, I do wave my hands a little bit when I say, you know, you'll know it when you see it. But, um, but there's actually some work behind that um, that I could maybe describe very briefly. Um, I, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of Pei Wang's definition of intelligence, which um, essentially isolates, 
It does a very clever thing uh, that uh, no one else really does explicitly, and that is it it separates novelty um, and um, creativity out of the um, intelligence equation. And, you know, we call a lot of things intelligent when people do it, including playing chess and learning chess and uh, coming up with ideas and so on. And, and his definition kind of hammers the point home that if you know how to do something, it doesn't really require intelligence because, uh, well, you know how to do it. And, and so um, you could say, you know, if you, you know, if you think in a, in a bit of a caricature way, you already have the, the ingredients for an algorithm for it. So what, what is it that humans do that, uh, that you couldn't really take out at all, um, uh, be, you know, without essentially uh, gutting the concept of intelligence? Um, and that is the, you know, coming up with these ideas, coming up with an algorithm, coming up with a way to, to do something, you know, solve a task or, or perform a task or, or solve a problem finding a solution to something where, where even people don't even know if, if a solution may exist. So, um, so this, I think, kind of cuts at the very heart of general intelligence. Um, a couple of years ago, I, came, I wrote a paper on the, the concept of uh, having a need for measuring um, how smart artificial intelligence is. And um, thinking about horsepower as a way to measure electric motors, uh, could we use uh, uh, an equivalent to human intelligence, come up with a unit called one human intelligence unit to measure yeah. how, how smart artificial intelligence is? And so then you go into a robot store 20 years in the future, and this, this robot's rated at 4 point, or 0.45 uh, HIU, and then the next one is rated at 2.0, uh, so it's twice as, as as smart as most humans. Um, and so then you would know uh, how much horsepower your your robot had that you were buying. Um, yeah. Is is that a, a reasonable um, idea that we're going to need something like that in the future? I don't think we need it. Um, well. I do I do agree with the idea that we need ways of measuring progress and performance. Um, in particular, I think what we're missing is a way to measure the performance of learning, the process of learning. So um, there's a huge difference between um, a neural net that's being trained, quote unquote, and a dog trainer that's training a dog to do something. So, uh, you know, it's a long list of differences, what's happening there, including the fact that we know that the deep neural networks don't learn in a very biological way. There's not a chance in hell that this is what's happening in the dog's mind or brain, mind brain. It's hard to separate it, you know, when you have wetware. Um, but we know that it, that's not the way it happens. The dog is, seems always ready to learn, uh, although uh, dogs learn uh, more or less uh, mostly by reinforcement learning, which is the simplest way to learn. Now, learning by observation, learning by uh, linguistic uh, um, instruction and so on, these are more sophisticated ways of learning. Uh, learning by reasoning. The, humans do all of these things it's hard for us to say whether they're very clever at it or not because we don't have anything to compare. We, we just have individuals, individual humans, we can compare them. But uh, that, that's not a really uh, scientific, you know, that's a statistical way, you know. And that's basically how psychology has done it. Let's just put all everyone on a normal curve and, and you know, put, put 100 in the middle. Uh, <laughs> yes, we do need ways of measuring. So I'm not saying that. But I don't think necessarily we have to uh, we don't necessarily need something as uh, clear and clean cut as uh, as horsepower or 
or wattage or 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 um, you know amperes uh, uh, friction etc voltage you know these concepts I think once if we get there and it's not uh, out of the question that we will uh, it will be a deco decomposited concept just like uh, uh, in in physics you, you won't have three terms I think you'll probably have five or seven some some odd number so <laughs> I'm, in, I'm just I'm just joking in, but uh, it, it won't be it will it will probably be more dimensions is what I'm getting at here so in terms of the underlying mechanism of intelligence where do you come down on the debate between the folks who think that there is a a general factor underlying it all and the people who think it's a billion different submodules that are sort of stitching together an answer. There's definitely a general factor in that, or should I say there's a, there's a probably a general mechanism or a small set of general mechanisms that play together. And depending on how they're rigged and how their parameters are tuned um, by birth and also by learning, um, because humans develop, you know, th there is a period before which we are, can handle double negatives, for instance. Five-year-olds cannot handle double negatives, and, and then seven-year-olds can. So this is very interesting. But um, the, um, yeah, th there is, um, I'll stop there. Okay. <laughs> There's a whole cliff you can... I could go on for a long time. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. So at, at this point, I think we should pivot to the work that you are currently doing. And the model you work on is called the Autocatalytic Endogenous Reflective Architecture, which is abbreviated A-E-R-A, and you pronounce ERA. So with all of the preceding discussion having laid some groundwork, why don't you just tell us what it is, how it works, and what makes it special? Yeah. To tie that to the, to the prior question... Uh, a little bit uh, and our prior discussion. Um, essentially, uh, ERA is the um, result of uh, complete um, redesign and rethinking of our methodology for doing AI. And um, my realization that uh, probably with or estimate that with current methodologies, which are by and large completely uh, and wholly, wholly inherited from computer science, uh, not, not created per specifically for AI, especially not for AGI, um, it would take somewhere around 100 to 300 years. And um, unless some miracle in medical science happens, then I won't get to see it. And, and that basically made me think, um, more, much more seriously and motivated me to think, to rethink our strategy and our methodology. Um, and as for the, the general, uh, the question about general principles or, or the G, the generality behind intelligence, intelligent behavior and, and uh, learning. Um, again, I, I, as I mentioned, uh, I think there is, there's a set of mechanisms and what we tried to do um, about a decade ago was to, to take a really thorough series. And we, we took about two years, more or less focusing exclusively on this, to list the requirements for a general intelligence at the time. And it turned out that the more we looked into that and, and asked ourselves the hard questions, um, the more it looked like very few, if any, had actually um, taken the time to list those requirements. And uh, so we ended up with a, with a list that has been published. And, and actually, since then, others have also published uh, very similar, uh, by and large, overlapping in most ways, uh, in most aspects, uh, similar list of, of requirements. What are, what are some of the requirements on that list? Um, so... Um, well, continuous learning, or what has been um, in the in, in the field of AI, 
and I suppose now I have to say and machine learning. But you know, to me, a machine learning is just a machine that learns. It's I don't look in the rear view mirror when I define terms. Um, I define terms in, in, according to their utility for uh, dealing with unanswered scientific questions. Sure. So I say, you know, I don't have to say machine learning when I say AI because um, an intelligent machine will always have to be able to learn. But what kind of learning would it do? Well, it should be able to learn at any time. If I tell it that, um, well, look, everything you thought about how the internet works is wrong. Um, that that should should allow it to put a minus sign in front of the, the complete set of everything it knows about the internet, and um, well, um, that is the caricature again that I'm painting there. My point is basically that uh, most of the approaches that have uh, even addressed the issue of general intelligence have. Um, have had trouble with that kind of incremental, uh, um, specific, um, or, or scope-related uh, um, new information that changes what you already know. And um, so a, a machine of that sort will, will also actually have to weigh this information, this new information, the the validity of it. So it shouldn't only have the opportunity, uh, if it really truly believes me when I say that everything it knows about the internet, it thinks it knows, you know, is wrong. It it um, it, it shouldn't only uh, be able to basically, quote unquote, invert all of that or or basically mark it as potentially wrong. It should also be able to evaluate what I mean by that. And, uh, and depending on how I use words and how I've used words before, am, do I, am I prone to exaggeration and uh, to exaggerating? And if, I'm, and, and, and if so, um, when I tell someone, you know, everything you, you thought you knew about cars is wrong, you know, they, if I read an article uh, or, you know, see an article with that title, I don't think, you know, oh, that's that's someone working at, at the New York Times. Uh, so every so they, and of course they must be right. So everything I know about cars is wrong. No, I don't. That's not how I interpret that. Right. I I put that in a context and I, I am I, I'm able to uh, specifically target that title to particular parts of my knowledge. Now, if I start reading that article, and typically, you know, that's typically going to make me really mad because articles with those kinds of titles tend to be annoying, you know, clickbait. Yep. So I will glance through it because I know I know that, and I'll glance through it and see, okay, what's his point? Okay, uh, he says, you know, well, we'll have, you know, there will be no gasoline cars in in five years. You know, how? First of all, he did not know that I thought that they would still be continue to be around and secondly i think right. he's probably wrong you know so it it's this and and in 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 ai this kind of ability has been called meta knowledge mm -hmm. and you have a handful of articles on meta knowledge each year it's a handful i mean you can count it on two hands pretty much um our conclusion was meta has to be part of the complete package otherwise we won't be we won't have uh, a system that does not is not capable of meta anything, and and we think you know we'll we'll engineer in later, will not have the ability to do cognitive development. And if it can't do cognitive development, it couldn't possibly uh, match anything that humans do. Yeah, so it it sounds like what you're describing is a reinforcement learning system with some kind of dynamic concept ontology each concept, each node in which is tagged with a probability based on the trust that it puts in the source with maybe a front end that handles natural language processing. Um, 
I'm, I'm imagining that the architecture you have in mind is far grander than that. So yes. can you tell me if I, yeah, I do, I have it completely I, wrong. Like in what ways is, is your work yeah, in advance on what I just described? You are so wrong. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Productively wrong. I hope yeah, that's here. It's, uh, it's awesome. Um, yeah. <laughs> so essentially when, when you ask the question, you know, how, how can you make a system that is, Okay, another another requirement on the list. Uh, to be fair to you, of course, I hadn't listed all of the requirements. Yeah, we're, we're on requirement number one so far. Yeah, so I know. <laughs> I don't think I had all I needed to paint the picture. <laughs> <laughs> so um, another very important one, and and hopefully we can we can leave it at that because you know we got six or seven requirements on this list. Uh, they're not all equally easy to explain in a podcast, but sure. um, but uh, a second one and very important one is domain independence. So this system should be able to learn pretty much anything and everything independent of what kind of data it, it's, uh, it, it consists of and, and how it's presented. Now, of course, there will be differences. As, as we know, humans have an easier time learning certain things if they're presented in one way versus another way. Yep. It's not so hard, actually, to make learning hard for humans. So we shouldn't expect we shouldn't expect to discover like some completely data in de- data format independent way of learning. That's, that's not the point we're making. The point we're making is that um, there shouldn't be like a huge difference between how this system learns language versus how it learns anything else. So we're, we don't create modules, you know, there's a language module and then there's the motor control module. And then there's, you know, anything else, you know, math module and, you know, but, this does not scale. This is exactly what's been wrong with uh, the AI uh, methodology for 50, 60 years. I shouldn't say 60. I should probably say, you know, leave the, the first 10 years, you know, anything and everything went. So there, it's really fascinating to read the old papers from the first 15 years of AI after, after the Dartmouth conference, because um, it's, you know, it's basically an agenda for AGI. And then it just completely <laughs> was left behind. But um, so so data independence and continuous learning. So this system should be able to lo- use the same mechanism to learn a language, uh, to learn to run, to, to, to learn uh, uh, the game of chess. So a uniform way of learning. And this, uh, and Alan Newell actually was was very uh, found this uh, very important point. He wrote a book um, a few years before he died uh, called "Unified Theories of Cognition," which is one of my one of my uh, uh, favorite uh, books in, in of for, of reading in in this field in the past thirty years. Um, the the, the system we ended up with is essentially is based on, on uh, principles that are so different um, to everything out there that it's, it's really hard to explain it to anyone, even people in computer science, because they don't, I mean, I have an easier time explaining this system to biologists and engineers than computer scientists for some reason. And yeah, I also have my theories about why that is, but that that may be a, a, a topic maybe for beer later. <laughs> um, I I think because there's a there's a lot of interesting thing about the system, and, and it's not just a fantasy system that we've been writing about but haven't implemented yet, because we have implemented and we have actually uh, quite um, in, impressive data explaining and and demonstrating how it how it works. Well, let's talk a little bit about that then, the implementation and the tests that you've put it through. Yeah. Okay. So um, to start, maybe I should uh, just explain briefly uh, some of the principles of its operation. Um, the, the system works essentially by producing hypotheses about relationships between experiences. So everything is experience-based. And uh, the main reason for that is another, is a third requirement essentially on that requirements list, which is uh, this system has to be able to learn without a teacher. 
Now, there may be situations where it takes for, you know really long time to learn something because the data is obscure and and uh, you have to learn a lot before you can learn this one thing that you know we we know this from humans. Uh, you know you don't teach people when you when you teach kids how to write you don't you know you don't hand them Shakespeare. You you have to teach them the letters and then you teach them how letters combine and, and so on. It's the old story of not throwing the baby into the deep end of the pool. Because if you, if if you have a, a layers of uh, of skills, where where uh, you know even if the top layer is really simple, it requires all the other layers be, below it. You know you can't jump there immediately. So so this is um, um, so this is a requirement that the system has to be able to learn on its own without a teacher or tutor. And uh, or external reinforcement or anything like that. Um, so that means it needs to bo be born with a seed, cognitive seed of some sort, that drives the learning. Because if it if it doesn't have any drive at the beginning, it's not going to do anything. It's just uh, there's no difference between it and a rock. So so already right there we have a very different system. Now what's going to be in this seed? Um, think of a plant. You know the the, the plant seed or seed for a tree, it has, it must have some way of sensing the right conditions to sprout. Because otherwise, you know, if it's sitting on my desk and it just starts sprouting, it's, it's going to die essentially because there, it doesn't have the ingredients that it needs for, for, for growing. So um, it has sensors. It has already data. It has assumptions built in about the environment that it's put in. It has assumptions that uh, that it, if it doesn't sprout, it's going to be in a dry place and so on and so on. Now, these are, of course, chemical, much more so than we're talking about cognitive and, you know, the cognitive equivalent of this. But it, it's the same principle hold, the same idea. So um, what's what's going to be in the seed? Well, um, we um, in, in Arrow, you, you can actually have... Uh, anything from something very primitive if you wanted to, to learn everything from scratch. But you can put in stuff if you want. You can tell it stuff. You can you can specify uh, certain circumstances in the seed. And um, you can also tell it that when you learn something that's better than what I told you, you know, get rid of that. And so, so that's a very different system. And now, it grows from a seed and... Uh, it, it grows by experience. So it, it, it does something to the environment and something comes back and it experiences life. That data is coming in incrementally, just like in nature. You can't be everywhere uh, at the same time, um, at all points in time. You're fixed in time and your sensors are limited to that point in time. Now, you may have um, wide angle cameras in, uh, for eyes, but you have to point them somewhere. So you're not sensing everything for every point in time. You're actually uh, limited to this trickle. And this is for every world where the amount of data is vastly larger, in fact, you know, infinitely larger for the physical world than um, your processing capacity. So, 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 can, so that's going to be a fact of life that's always going to be the case. And if you want to do human level intelligence, it better handle that. Um, okay. you, you've been talking a lot about the capabilities list, and I wanted to ask the opposite side of the equation. Uh, I mean, when people hear about artificial intelligence, they're wondering how it's going to invade their lives. Am I still going to have a job in the future? And, and so when we talk about the capabilities of artificial general intelligence, what are, uh, do you also have a list of the limitations of things that it can't go beyond? Or is that uh, kind of a fuzzy gray space that we haven't uh, clearly um, uh, really defined the limits yet? Yeah, I can, um, I can say something real quick about that. Um, essentially, we don't we don't have clear enough ideas about how to make human level intelligence to even uh, begin to list the 
potential limitations that that those systems will eventually have when we get there. Um, I find it very unlikely that we will want to replicate humans. Uh, uh, I uh, I agree with Steven Pinker there that he 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 puts it uh, very well actually um, in several of his writings and interviews that um, you, uh, uh, you if you want to if you want to make a shovel you don't make it in the shape of a hand you know because we have hands we don't need to make shovels that look like hands and are exactly the same size and yeah. and the shape you know we 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 need we need shovels that are different from hands right so yes i can dig with my hands that's that's great and and you know in some cases that's the right thing to do you know you're but uh, in in most other in most cases where you need to shovel anything, you need something that's different from hand. So that's how our AIs are going to be. And this is completely besides the question, the scientific question of how does the human mind work. And I I really do think that the the ultimate uh, you know um, Richard Feynman uh, said you know if I don't uh, if I cannot build it, I don't understand it. And so I think he was right. Uh, that is exactly uh, um, why one of the reasons why we want to make AI, because we it's the strongest mechanism for really making sure that we do understand how the mind works. Um, the principles of, of, of a human mind and any mind, in fact. Um, so I, I don't really, um, I don't en enjoy those discussions very much because they, um, because I'm, I'm most interested in how does this work, the mechanisms of how it works. So in ERA, what we have is essentially a learning mechanism that is very domain independent. It's, um, it's data independent and in that it works on any data. And we have essentially demonstrated ERA learning how to do an interview um in a real time you know so so here's the fourth requirement um real time it has to be able to uh, uh handle time and has to have some level of grounding in in the passage of time we call it real time um i i don't agree with engineers who say, well, define real time for me. Is it, is it one microsecond or is it one millisecond? Or what is it? What's real time? Now, real time means that up to a point, you can be bound to an external clock. So um, there are limits to that. Of course, there are limits. You know, the speed of light is a limit. That's clear. Sure. We're, we're far from that. But, but we're basically saying, you know, if if you have an AI that's real time, it me and it, and let's say it's general enough that you can talk to it. You could you could say to it, you know, I want you to be downstairs in five seconds, and it could tell you I can't do that. You know, it's bound enough to fit the physical world to time to know what that means and know that that is not possible for itself. Uh, it could say, you know, if it's really really smart, it could say, well, I can't do it, but I could build you a machine that could do it. You know, but um, so, so, uh, so that's, uh, uh, yeah, so back to the interview, um, essentially, um, we chose this, um, a real time interview, one on one interview, uh, to demonstrate how general and how bound to the physical turn of events, you know, time series, uh, this system can work. And it, it essentially, in, in about 20 hours, it learned to take an interview. Uh, of an expert in uh, in recycling. So it observes humans, two humans, doing an interview on recycling. And after it had observed um, the this um, back and forth um, for 20 hours, it could actually do a real-time interview in either role. It, that's not, not really interesting. Uh, you know, that's not impressive if I don't tell you what we what we told it up front. What's, what was in the seed of that learner? Well, uh, it was a very, very small seed. It, it, it essentially, it was about three pages of code. And wow. um, 
very generally, for instance, we did not tell it anything about grammar. We did not give it a, a vocabulary. We did not tell it that an interview consists of questions and answers. In, instead, actually, what we told it was its goal and the goals of these, um, its goal is to learn and the goals of, of both of the interviewer and interviewee. What's the goal of an interviewer? It's to get the interviewee to talk. And what's the goal of an interviewee is to please the interviewer. So if it doesn't have natural language, you didn't tell it anything about grammar, how do you specify the goals? What, what does that mean? Yeah, so you, so one of the top level drives in a machine like that has to be bound in some way to observable variables. Okay. So, because then otherwise it couldn't bootstrap itself. Sure. So we, we did, we did in this demo, we did it this way. We said, um, basically, um, the goal of the interviewee is to please the interviewer and the interviewer is pleased when the interviewer nods. Okay. It's one way uh, to know that the interviewer is pleased. <laughs> and I see you're nodding. <laughs> I, I'm nodding, yes. Yeah, so, we're, yeah. we're not nodding so off. <laughs> now, so, so, what, so we had five uh, drives like that. Uh, of, of similar kind as examples of how you can observe evidence of something. Okay. And everything else, so those are top level drives and everything else is derived from the learner. It basically looks at this data, this real time data, it, it's observing the data back and forth between the, we did it over um, uh, like a Skype connection or a Zoom connection like we're, we have here, where, um, where it, instead of um, uh, you seeing my uh, pixel image, you would see an avatar. So we, we drove a virtual environment basically from the, from the motions of the human, of the humans. And uh, speech is just going through, through a speech recognizer and a prosody analyzer. So all of the behavior of the, of the participants is digitized, and, but it's real time. And the um, so that so that the so that era the era agent can intercept the data flow and learn from it. So um, yeah, so that's uh, that's essentially that that uh, that system. And, and the to to give you some examples of, of sentences, you know, um, that it had to figure out how to not only to inter. Uh, to interpret, but also to generate, because it could take either role. Uh, the the interviewer asks the interviewee. You've got sort of a si similar situation as as you have here. Uh, he points to uh, to an object on a virtual table and says, "Tell me about this object." And the interviewee, that's who's an expert in the, in recycling, picks up the object. Let's say and says, uh, this is a cardboard box. Cardboard can be recycled. It's made of fiber and so on. And, um, you know, tell me more, maybe, and, and so on. So this, this back and forth happens. And, and uh, we, didn't, we didn't tell it either about uh, pointing gestures and, uh, or turn taking or any of that. It had to infer that from the top level goal and the data that it gets. So I, I'm interested in the underlying mechanism by which learning happens in this system. So I'm a machine learning engineer. And mm -hmm. when I say that a linear regression learns, what it means is that it minimizes some cost function or maximizes some utility function or a reinforcement learning agent has to devise a policy that allows it to accomplish a goal in the presence of certain constraints. So what does learning look like in ERA? So it's getting this stream of data. Is it building yeah. concepts? What, what is it trying to maximize the yeah. amount of nodding? Because that could be hijacked, obviously, as a reward channel. Yeah, you, you, can, you, could, um, you could call it concepts. Um, but essentially, um, it, it's maybe a bit more granular than that. Um, what ERA does is it, it 
it is an implementation of a theory of pragmatic understanding. So I have a, a theory of pragmatic understanding that essentially um, breaks understanding down uh, to, to four principles. Um, and um, once you have that kind of a knowledge representation, you can, uh, you can predict things. That, that's the simplest one. You can use the, the knowledge to get things done. Um, you can explain them and you can recreate them. So uh, in ERA, essentially uh, what uh, ERA does is it creates hypotheses about how um, events are related. And then, and, the, and, and it's like a mini scientist. It basically says, um, I've got at least three ways of, of explaining the relationship between these data points, you know, between this time series. And it's working at a very low level, you know, um, with very tiny measurements. Uh, just to take an example, to make this more concrete, you know, we, we basically defined the word as a data type. So it, it sees the word, uh, it's just bytes to it, you know. It's a byte, it's a byte sequence, essentially. But to us, it, of course, you know, uh, uh, you, you see uh, a glass, this glass is made of, and so on, okay. But these are just strings to it. Um, and so uh, for the sequence of, of, of constructing sentences, it has to build the hierarchy of relationships. And it does this by making a hierarchical theory at, from the lowest level to the highest level. So it bridges from the data up to the drives. Um, and it does that by creating hypotheses like a scientist would maybe do. You know, it says it sees this word and that word and or, or it sees, you know, I pick up this object and it hears and it sees it sees this motion in 3D is what I should say. So you, you, to bring you down to its level and it sees uh, at around a similar time the word uh, glass. And it. It it, it bring it, it creates a hypothesis that either one of these causes the other. So all of all of the knowledge in era is essentially based on causal relational models at a at a very low level of granularity. And but once it gets some of those right, it can now make hypotheses about higher level relationships. What is it that constrains the space of possible hypotheses? Because there's a well-known problem in the philosophy of science, which... The seed. W w okay. Um, the seed, essentially, uh, um, think about the baby. Um, the, a, ba a human baby, um, all it can do, you know, and, and I'm talking cognitively, is basically cry and maybe laugh. <laughs> okay. Yeah. What, is, what are the assumptions in, in, in its cognitive seed? Well, the assumptions are there's a caretaker. Because this, this strategy, this bootstrapping seed does not work if you don't have a caretaker. You can't survive by crying unless there's a caretaker. And so, so that's essentially the same thing here. Um, the, it, it's, it's an art form to come up with a seed that works in the most general of conditions. Uh, for the human baby, this is a very narrow, uh, this is a very strict requirement. You know, there has to be a caretaker. But we have stories about wolves taking care of human babies, right? So apparently it, it doesn't, if that's true, then it doesn't only work for human caretakers. It might work in other cases. But it's still, uh, but it's still a realistic requirement because human babies come from humans. And those humans that make babies have to be of a certain age. That that is sufficient, hopefully, to be a caretaker. Yeah. So you see, this is this is basically nature's way. For an AI, we can do this in all sorts of ways. Of course, um, we don't have to model nature, of course. But um, so that's essentially um, that's that's the idea there. Now, 
if you have an AI, an era agent that where you know it's going to be um, raised in a in a lab with a lot of uh, PhD students, you know, of course you can stuff the seed with a lot more, you know, so it it goes quick more quickly and so on. Um, um, so we're we're running out of time here, but I wanted to ask you one final question. The um, uh, a lot of the the headlines talk about the dangers of AI and um, and uh, famous people like Elon Musk and Stephen Hawking and Bill Gates talk about things going awry and and uh, but I wanted to ask you the question of what do you see as uh, are there uh, serious dangers out there and what do we need to watch out for? Um, we need to watch out for abuse of knowledge. Now we're we're already watching out for abuse of information. Okay. Um, we already have several dangerous cases of uh, of information warfare. So we we are we're kind of uh, um, yeah we we've, we've kind of bumped into that that uh, obstacle. The there's another obstacle which is basically uh, abuse of this technology. Um, because it comes with some very unique features that may not be obvious, uh, immediately obvious. Uh, so we, it's a good thing to think about. Um, I am mainly concerned and almost exclusively concerned with human abuse of knowledge and, um, and this kind of scientific power. Okay, so basically devious people having access to... Um uh, powerful tools, so to speak. That's the most dangerous one. Another yeah. is also unintended side effects of how we engineer our society. All right. All right. Well, this was remarkable. Thank you so much for joining us today. And uh, where should people go if they want to find out more about your work? Um, so I, I founded this uh, AI lab at Reykjavik University called CADIA, Center for Analysis and Design of Intelligent Agents. So you can go to cadia.ru, reykjavikuniversity.is, and see that. Um, also, um, I uh, direct the, um, the Icelandic Institute for Intelligent Machines. We do more practical projects there with industry. So that's another. But, you know, my, my publication list, I think, is, is probably uh, most relevant to this interview. Oh, very nice. We will direct people to those resources. And thank you again for being here. Yeah, thank you. This has been Thanks great. Thanks for inviting me. Thanks. Good pleasure.